Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at biases by building and testing out the pair. While a simple project on the surface, the devil does lie in the details. It's one thing to make a good schematic and it's a completely different thing to make a good practical circuit. So if you're curious about what sort of problems you can run into, as well as a few solutions, then keep watching. Today's video is sponsored by JLC PCB. They provide easy, affordable and reliable PCB and PCBA solutions, empowering electronics engineers to develop projects efficiently. For today's project, I will be using a set of their FR4 two-layer PCBs, but also a CNC machined housing to build some biases. Ordering a set of boards is as easy as dragging your Gerber files onto their website and setting a few configurations. Up to 8-layer boards can be obtained for as little as $2, and you can get a $30 coupon for the 6-layer boards. So even larger PCB sizes can be obtained for only $5. Easy to use, affordable to make, and reliable. Check out the link in the description for more details. So, first thing to consider is whether you actually need the bias D or not. I mean, if you have an amplifier down the line, Surely you need to supply it, but it's important to first observe if the receiver or circuit that you're using doesn't already have a bias D built into it to begin with. So what I have here is an RTL SDR. And if we look closely on the board, right at the RF connector side, there is a series inductor with some sort of high side switch supplying it. So this is usually activated using the software control. In a similar fashion, this SDR play has a bias T built with two ferrites in series, providing a bit better isolation and probably a wider bandwidth. So having the bias T already built into the receiver brings a few important aspects into play. It's already there, so you don't need to bother adding another one. However, this only works if the supplied voltage and current are sufficient to power the intended circuit. The first project I needed the bias T for was the vacuum tube antenna amplifier. This needs a bit more power than the average SDR can provide. About 12 volts at 1 ampere. So the first bias T that I worked on was as follows. For the inductor, I used a relatively large 33 microhenry toroid inductor with a ferrite bead in series. And for the capacitor, I left both a large film through hole component as well as a small ceramic in parallel. Since this bias T was supposed to work down to the AM band, both the capacitor and the inductor need to be of relatively large value. Then, other than the core LC circuit, I added a set of decoupling capacitors to improve isolation. Now, while not mandatory, I did add a few more things to the circuit. So first off, I added a set of back-to-back -back diodes on the SDR side, so the RF only side, and while the 1 and 4148 isn't really a dedicated transient suppressor, it should help a bit, especially during turn-on and off events, or if something unforeseen arrives from the tube LNA. Then, since this circuit is supposed to supply quite a high current, I also added in a shunt resistor, which is read out, using a needle indicator. Anyway, after the shunt, there are a few more capacitors, an indicator LED, and a diode placed to protect the circuit in case a reverse potential is accidentally applied from the connector. Now, some designs also use a fuse here, which maybe would not have been a bad idea. But anyway, this is what I ended up building. From a layout point of view, this is not a very complicated board. The RF trace in between the connectors needs to be kept at a 50 ohm value, and as much as possible, ground clearance needs to be kept around it. But other than this, the board should just accommodate the rest of the components, which are interconnected on the other side of the board. Since this particular bias T was not really intended for very high frequency, mainly the HF bands, this sort of placement should be just fine. For the assembly, I ended up using a large case size resistor for the shunt, the small component initially planned was burning out, and for the large toroid inductor, I used some insulated wire in an attempt to reduce its self-capacitance. 
My idea was that this should keep the distance in between the conductors a bit larger. And I also added in a bit of hot glue just to keep things in place. Other than that, nothing really noteworthy to mention. Now, to see if everything was in order, I connected this to the SDR and the loop antenna and turned everything on. And well, waited for the tube to heat up. And sure enough, the circuit does indeed seem to work. You can get quite a nice reception with it. However, this sort of test does not prove that the bias T was built correctly, just that some amount of the signal is passing through it. So to confirm the operation, we need to measure its various parameters. For this, first I fired up the VNA, connected it to the BC, and started going through the various measurements. So first off, the return loss and insertion loss measurements. I measured from 500 kHz up until 100 MHz. And with this, we can observe that while right at 500 kHz, the return loss is quite high, at around minus 15 decibels, it does stay below the 20 decibel threshold for the rest of the range. Similar story can be said about the VSVR. It stays below 1.2 for most of the range, so except the 500 kHz point. For the insertion loss, the software that I'm using does not have a direct way of expressing this, but it's the S21 measurement with a minus in front. So the numerical values are the same. Here we can see again that we are getting pretty decent values, only getting to the 1 decibel threshold point at the 100 MHz mark. So in essence, this bias T is quite well suited for the HF bands. Now next, I wanted to see if there's any sort of difference when measuring from one side or the other. So I swapped the VNA ports and redone the three measurements. So here I just overlap the two measurements and well, while they're not perfectly the same, the differences are quite small. Next, to measure the isolation, so to see how much of the RF signal gets into the DC supply path, I soldered an SMA connector onto the supply connector, so normally I would be using a barrel jack, but I didn't really have a jack tube SMA adapter. So that's why I did this. And of course, one port was being measured and the other was terminated with a 50 ohm termination. And well, if we look here at the results, we do seem to be getting quite a big difference in the behavior of the two ports. So whether we're measuring from the RF port towards the DC or from the RF plus DC port towards the DC. While the RF port is quite well isolated, the RF plus DC port is not so much. But granted, in both cases, we are above the 40 dB threshold. So while that's good, this sort of large discrepancy is still strange. Now, one thing that I noticed was that the current shunt resistor was placed very close to the RF inductor. So this might cause quite a bit of capacitive coupling in between the two, which is not something you really want. So just to try and correct this, I bent the resistor away a bit. And by doing this, the graph from the reference to the new measurement did indeed change. So I got a few extra dBs, especially on the lower frequency side. So while the two graphs are distorted, I did this to get the same scale on both of them. While this bias D did work as intended for the HF bands, I also tried using it for an ADS-B setup. I mean, it's a bias D. The behavior at 10 MHz or 1.1 GHz should be similar, right? So while the setup did work, to some extent at least, I decided to recheck the circuit over a wider frequency range. So here I set the measurement to go from 30 MHz up until 3 GHz. And well, it's something. We see that both the return loss and VSVR, above a few hundred MHz, become quite terrible, but also the insertion loss has a steady increase before plateauing at around 4 dB and then further increasing. So while this bias T will work above 100 MHz, it won't be that great. Now, in all honesty, I was not expecting this circuit to work very well up to very high frequencies, but I was still curious to understand what the issue actually was. What is the limiting factor? Is it the components, the protection diodes, the board? Well, after running a 
QTS, I finally found the culprit. It was the connectors. So to highlight this, I took two BNC connectors and soldered them one onto the other with nothing else in between. So this assembly should behave like a very short piece of 50 ohm coax cable. It should. So when measuring this, the values are all over the place. We are seeing very bad return loss and VSVR, as well as quite a lot of insertion loss. So while this does not completely account for the issues of the bias team, we can safely say that the connector is a major contributor. Now, in an effort to try and understand what really is the problem, the explanation that I came up with was that while the cylinder part of the connector is a 50 ohm unbalanced transmission line, the connector to PCB connection, which is done with two parallel lines, is a roughly 250 ohm balanced transmission line. The large impedance mismatch between this line and the coax is causing the large return loss and thus the high insertion loss. So the problem is not that this is a BNC connector, but rather the way in which it's connected to the board. A different BNC connector, like this one, that has the coaxial bit up to the board and has an all-round ground connection, should be much better than the other connector that has the two parallel lines. This brings a very important topic into focus. Any RF project, no matter how well designed and simulated, can be completely ruined by some bad connectors. So to try and improve on things, I decided to have another go at making a bias tee, but this time specifically fine-tuned for high frequency operation. So with this design, I wanted to do things a bit differently. First of all, two SMA connectors, both in line, so not really the 90 degree type. Then I wanted to experiment a bit with the inductors. So I added two ferrites, as well as a 33 microhenry ferrite core inductor. But also I added in parallel a couple resistors, as well as an RC network. Then for the decoupling network, I used a large 4.7 microfarad capacitor, as well as a bit of room for some other components. Finally, I added in an LED and the supply connector. So with this design, I'm not really expecting any large currents, so I removed everything else. Final thing to remark is the series capacitor. This is only a 3.3 nanofarad capacitor, so the bias T was not really intended to be used at low frequency. However, the other reason for this component, other than I already had it around, was that it's a C0G type, so it's a low loss capacitor, but also the case size. It's 1206. And well, this case size matches up quite nicely with the trace needed to make a 50 ohm transmission line on this specific board stack up. So the main cause of return loss are discontinuities present in the signal path. These could be the connectors, but also the series elements, like the capacitor. As long as the size is similar to that of the trace, then you should have a smaller amount of reflections. Other than this, I try to keep the RF trace as short as possible, so to minimize dielectric losses, that's why the board is so narrow. And well, from here, I place the various components running towards the supply connector. Finally, to improve the isolation, the various components are spread out and placed as far away as possible from the RF line. To check things out, I went for a similar set of measurements as before, but only focused on the 30 MHz to 3 GHz range. So if we start looking at the return loss, it's pretty decent. It stays below minus 15 dB up until around 1.5 GHz. And we also have a VSVR value below 1.4 up until the same range. And while the value does increase later, it still stays below about 1.6 over the entire range. Then for the insertion loss, while we do exceed the 1 dB threshold around the same 1.5 GHz, it's still staying within quite acceptable values even above. So while not ideal, a value of 1.6 dB of attenuation for a homemade device could be quite acceptable. Now looking in from the other side, we do see that a few differences do occur. So while not that critical, it's also not the same thing. 
So in general, it will be important to check a bias T both ways, just to see which is producing the worst results. Next, I looked at the isolation, which was not that great. So we're in the 30 something dB range, not really the minimum recommended of 40. So what I tried to do to fix this was to add in a small extra decoupling capacitor. The important consideration here was not just the value of 100 nanofarads, but also the case size. So the smaller the case size of a component, the less series inductance it will present, so it will have a smaller impedance at high frequency. And well, sure enough, after adding this component, we gained a bit more isolation. So the minimum value went down by about 10 decibels. So with this modification, the attenuation is below 40 dB for the entire range. So both these biases ended up doing their job. These will be usable circuits. However, if I leave them as they are, they will most probably break. So some sort of enclosure will be needed to protect the boards. For the large bias team, I came up with this 3D printed box, which is quite square, but it also has room for the needle indicator. So the board just slides in and the indicator is held in place by this support. It's worth noting that having a wire just hanging around in the RF box is not really recommended, so you should try to avoid having this coming in contact with the RF traces. To finish things off, there's an end piece that is held in place with two screws. So these just thread into the plastic, and well, now we're done. For the small bias team, I wanted to try something a bit more special. So JLC also offers CNC machining. So I went with a CNC machined aluminum bit to enclose the circuit. This covers all of the RF bits, so no noise should enter or exit the device on this side. For the other side, since it's not that critical, again I went with a plastic bit. Finally, to close everything up, I used a set of M3 screws that go through the entire set, and the metal bit also has threads inserted. So you can specify not just the dimensions, but also thread properties when CNC machining parts. Finally, when mounted in an enclosure, both of these devices will most likely have a far longer lifespan. In the end, building a bias T can be quite a fun and interesting endeavor. It's not the most complicated circuit in the world, but it does require a bit of attention to details to get it working correctly. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be updated with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.